Thank you so much to all our panelists for their insights. Uh, I think if I had to uh, impose an overarching theme uh, emerging from their comments, uh, to me it's that our maybe our initial paradigm of what it will mean or require to do open science well is now giving way to a more mature realization of what it will take. Uh, in my mind, the initial paradigm is one of just setting individual patient data free into the scientific marketplace and allowing them to be uh, taken up by those who would reanalyze and replicate like, uh, like butterflies being caught in a net. And I think what we've heard today is that that is uh, necessary but not sufficient, uh, that it won't get us where we need to be. Um, and that's largely due to the degree of complexity involved in, in reanalyzing data, uh, but also secondarily to incentives. So what is needed is, in fact, standards to make these data usable and useful, incentives for transparency and for taking up the task of replication. And, and here we heard that regulators, journals, and funders are among uh, those who can use leverage to make that happen. Um, and then finally, harnessing the power of technology to create new analytic possibilities. This advance of computing and technology, I think, as the last presentation underscored, has made it easier to submerge uh, uh, analytical techniques that cause replication problems, but also holds the possibility of liberating us um, from, from some of the degree of complexity around data. So thank you again um, for bringing these insights to us. It's now my pleasure to open the floor for questions, and I believe we have some microphones out there. If you have the microphones, could you hold your hand? Okay, so one here and, and one here. So, uh, and you have a microphone as well? Okay, you'd like to use a microphone. Okay, terrific. So if we can have, um, if, you, if you would walk towards those who have the microphones, I think that would be best. And um, you can address your uh, questions to a panelist in particular or to the entire panel. Okay, let's start over here. Yep. Yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, Mildred Cho from the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. Thank you for a great panel. Uh, and I wanted to ask the panelists if they have sort of considered the um, idea, although it, because the word community had come up several times, uh, if they are including in that non-professional scientists uh, in that definition of community. And I ask that because in part, I think a lot of the movement towards things that people call citizen science, for example, are in part driven because of the lack of transparency and that that threatens to kind of become a parallel world of science that is not integrated with professional science as we know it, uh, and um, that, um, you know, my thinking is that we need to encourage dialogue outside the silos of professionalized science to include groups that are uh, using data and contributing data, uh, given the technology that we have that makes that quite uh, widespread. Who'd like to take that one? So one of the um, motivating uh, factors, well, one of the things I find most <coughs> motivating in my work is the idea that, uh, say, a talented high school student who's curious could actually start digging into these results in the scholarly record and maybe rerun things, try some of these algorithms, try it on a different data set, which right now is pretty much, with a few exceptions, pretty much impossible for them to do. And so this notion of how we actually reintegrate findings into the scholarly record, I hope we solve this, and I hope we don't end up with sort of parallel discussions happening. Um, what I've seen in the citizen science community generally isn't that type of intellectual contribution. The tendency now, at least as far as I've seen, is that data contribution. So they'll do things like collect data and then contribute or sort of hand it off to a scientist to do the study. Um, so, um, so I've written about sort of extending that pipeline and having that sort of the intellectual engagement really reach out to citizen scientists, which I think is very important. I'd like to believe that um, science progresses on merit and good ideas will make it into the scholarly record. We've seen some examples of that in astronomy, for example. So I'd like to believe that we're not going to bifurcate into these two communities, that there will be that overlap when the discoveries warrant publication. So uh, uh, thank you for your question. And I'm glad we started out with it, because I think including consumers, let's say lay people, non-scientists officially, um, in all our discussions at different levels is incredibly important. And the main problem, as I see it, is people don't get it. Um, they may think that they're involving consumers, and they aren't. Um, they, and, and I think there are 
all different levels at which consumers can contribute. They might be able to be citizen scientists, um, and I think we see that with non-clinical trials, especially where they're contributing in their electronic medical record. I heard um, at a meeting I just attended that now all John Deere tractors, or the new ones, uh, you can get it so that they're collecting data as they go along until the earth or whatever they're doing. Uh, the trouble is the data go nowhere that no one really understands. So we have to make sure that the data that are being collected are going somewhere too. But also we can include um, consumers in all our discussions if, for example, we're designing a clinical trial. One thing we found is that the adverse events are especially important. And um, choosing the outcomes for studies is incredibly important. But we have to understand what people are concerned about and make sure those data are accessible, that that's part of science. And we have to believe that what the consumers believe is as important is as important as, say, a lab value. Yeah. Andrew Ballas from Augusta University, Georgia. I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that uh, we talked about uh, standards. And uh, I need to uh, quote uh, Clem McDonald, who said that the good thing about the healthcare data standards is that there are so many to choose from. <laughs> and I think that uh, really shows that uh, we, have, we can have very limited hopes invested in, uh, in uh, data standardization. Uh, the question relates uh, more to the uh, uh, kind of downstream impact of non-repeatable research and how it influences industries that try to build a product on that and they try to launch a, a startup companies based on studies that actually turn out to be a, a non-repeatable. And I think that uh, there are quite a few stories in the world where uh, the uh, purchasing and the supply management made a tremendous uh, difference. So I wonder if uh, as we deal with the uh, uh, problem of non-repeatable science, uh, we should look into uh, the, uh, the ways we can better purchase good scientific results that are worthy of practical application. Would you agree with that? You want to try that sure. one? I think that's a great point. The, uh, there's incredible waste uh, both for individual researchers and for the dollars going in uh, to uh, taking basic uh, or preclinical science and turning it into application when there isn't actually a solid basis uh, for it. Uh, and the solutions don't require a huge shift in budgets. They require a very small shift in budgets. For those, there's so much research that gets done, most of it has almost no impact. So we don't need to investigate replicability of all research. Uh, what we need to do is devote a small amount of resources to those research areas that are actually changing uh, how people are doing their work, uh, applying in different directions. So there are, I mean, there are a number of different ways uh, to think about how to solve that problem. Uh, but one simple one is to generate some tools to help people think about what's important to replicate. So a, a statistic of replication value is an easy one, right? How much is this getting cited versus how precise is the estimate? Uh, for the effect uh, that was under investigation, right? Those two things are playing some role. If no one's citing it, then it doesn't matter. Uh, if it's highly precise, then we already have a good understanding of the phenomenon. Uh, so just developing some tools like that to give resources to funders, researchers, and editors to all see prioritization uh, of what we need to spend some resources replicating would go a long way. Could I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Is, um, is citation really a measure of impact? Because the people using information from research aren't necessarily the same as those citing it. Yeah, so it, it's just obviously one indicator, right? You could have many different ways of thinking about what, how do you operationalize impact. Uh, that's just the easiest one to count. Uh, so you could do that instantly today. Uh, and then other ones require a little bit more work. <laughs> I also wanted to, just on the heels of that question, flag another um, area where I see waste. Um, I'm sure this is true for every panelist, but students come to me and they say things like, uh, I'm losing confidence in the science that I'm doing in the lab. I'm not getting adequate mentorship. My um, advisor doesn't know anything about computational methods. I don't even know if I'm coding this correctly. No one ever looks at it. And I think a lot of the stuff is wrong, and I don't know what to do about it, and I'm thinking of quitting science. And this is terrible, right? If we start losing this younger generation who's computationally adept, students come into um, uh, grad school and then they're shocked we don't 
act more like open source software community where methods and code is sort of naturally and openly shared. What do you mean you're not sharing code? It, it just doesn't compute for them. And, uh, and so that's, that's an area where I think we're in grave danger of losing um, sort of the imagination of this younger generation. Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm Eric Ingelson. I'm at the Department of Medicine here at Stanford and Uppsala University in Sweden. And I'm a professor of epidemiology, which might have some impact on my question. So there is a barrier uh, where I stand working a lot with population-based science, and that is uh, that a lot of the informed consents were collected a long time ago, and that's something that we haven't really touched upon so far. So I wonder if you have any ideas about that. So basically what I'm talking about that is that the informed consent might have been taken several years ago or even decades ago, and way before we thought about open science, data sharing, perhaps even before internet was, uh, you know, was known. Uh, so I wonder, do you have any ideas about that? I think so probably sometimes people are lazy and want to own their data, but sometimes they are probably just impossible, it's just impossible to re-consent for economical reasons or just that you don't even know where the participants are. So do you have any ideas where we can go in terms of regulations, rules, or incentives? Well, I can highlight some of the um, some of the landscape around that extraordinarily complicated issue of informed consent. Even just thinking about data ownership. So now you have um, people in the public who are participating in studies and are informed enough about the open science, open data, and open science discussion, where they say things like, "I would actually like my data to be shared. It could help other studies, and that's fine with me." And IRBs don't really have a mechanism to process that sense of agency from the participant. They're very much in this notion of protection of, um, of human subjects, as they should be. Um, and so that's, but that's one sense of ownership of the data. That subject thinks it's their data and they need to be able to say what's gonna happen to it. Um, uh, you talk to a scientist who's carrying out the study, they think they own the data. Funding agencies might think they own the data. Repositories also think, I've invested a lot in curating this data, making it available, it's my data. Um, uh, there's a, there, maybe some journals are starting to house data and start to think of it as their data. So we're in this sort of very complicated landscape of ownership of data, who is actually gonna be responsible and be directing this, and it's open. You collaborate with industry, industry thinks they own the data, for example. And that only starts to step towards issues of informed consent, as you were sort of touching on, um, combining these data sets, for example, can um, obliterate what guarantees were made to initial human subjects who were involved in the, in the data sets themselves, because it could be, you know, I, I have one notion of the possibility of confidential data being leaked, and then tomorrow it's totally different because of new data sets that have come online that could be linked. And so um, I think Helen Nissenbaum calls this the, the end run around informed consent. And so all these notions are changing radically right under our feet, and a lot of them are being driven by the subjects in the, in the uh, studies themselves, and we need our mechanisms to catch up. So what to do about older informed consent? In my opinion, we are, we're bound by whatever we promise them. However, um, the, these guarantees are just crumbling out from under our feet as we become um, more open as a community and, and data becomes more open. Just to add a, a lawyerly comment to that in terms of the extent to which we're bound by the original consent, you know, the, there's a technological fix that, that puts us within the federal human subjects regulation, which is just to strip out identifiers and then, then this data can be released. But I think there's an ongoing debate within the bioethics community about whether this solution, which falls within the ambit of the law, adheres That's to right. our, no, our notions of what informed consent should mean, which yeah. is particularly in an era in which we know a lot about the possibilities of re-identification, is that an ethically defensible fix? Yeah. Yeah. It, Thanks for your question. Did you want to um, add something? Yeah, I actually wrote a piece in uh, BMJ a while back in which I took the uh, position, I, I feel free to disagree, that the older informed consent provisions that uh, uh, you know, say, basically say no one who's independent can ever reanalyze this data, the, I, I think that in and, of, in and of itself is unethical. To, to, dr to drag vulnerable patients into a clinical trial, and to me it's essentially tricking them into signing up to have their research that's being done upon them possibly be misrepresented to the public and to other patients, uh, as has often been the case, as I gave examples in my presentation, without any recourse for, for any sort of independent review by people who would respect confidentiality and, and, and have the uh, labels be uh, de-identified. De um, I think that is unethical to use people that way uh, for, for the particular advantage of the original investigators or the company that sponsored the research. 
Yeah, if I could, I'm so sorry. I'll just make a quick comment to follow up on that. Um, so one of the ideas that I've been proposing is this. We have this idea, to, it actually I think addresses that problem. We have this idea that data is closed, data is open. And I think we need to move to that big gray area in between. So data that's maybe partially open and what does that mean? Um, different communities or different people in the community could maybe be authorized in to analyze the data to start stepping towards that, those types of problems. So just because you have issues in the data like human subjects that uh, and you know legal issues that attach to the data that prevent you from making it openly available, it doesn't mean there aren't mechanisms like, for example, simulation or sort of new ideas that can sort of start to explore that gray area between open and closed so we can get some of the benefits of reproducibility and also protect and obey the law as well. And I just wanted to point out that Dr. Dixon, just quickly, Peter. Um, <laughs> some, I just wanted to point out that some trials done as long ago as 20 or so years ago did have in the informed consent that these data can be used by others. So we, it isn't an automatic can't be used. The informed consent didn't allow it. And this is an advantage of sharing more than the data that you can get feedback on the consent form, for example, and people can say, wait, you know, you've got to put something in there how the data can be used. Hi, I'm Mike Frank, Stanford Psychology. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing your recommendations on uh, technical and policy changes. Uh, but as a practicing scientist, um, somebody who tries to follow open practices, I also found them quite daunting. Uh, I try very hard to keep up on technical matters, but I still see that uh, there are ways in which my own work falls short. And I'm wondering uh, what your recommendations are, what we should be doing in terms of researcher training and in terms of graduate training to allow people to actually have the tools to follow these kinds of recommendations. Brian, maybe that's one for you to, to take on. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, oh, okay. so there's, yeah. there's more tomorrow. But uh, more people should take your course, Mike. Uh, that would solve a lot of this, because there's, uh, there are courses emerging uh, of how to do reproducible practices, the methodologies. Uh, we have a, uh, a small group that has been collecting uh, syllabi uh, to try to disseminate those more widely. Uh, and because there's a lot of applications across different disciplines of different people uh, trying to figure out how to do this effectively, efficiently, uh, and in the daily workflow of, of uh, research labs now, uh, I think there's just an enormous amount of training that is emerging uh, and will get uh, disseminated very rapidly because it's a common problem across disciplines. That's a great issue. I can't quite see who's next over there. We've got a light right in our faces, <laughs> please. Uh, uh, David Henry, University of Toronto. Um, I just want to go back to the issue of preserving confidentiality of data. It really is a big issue. Uh, just as an aside, I think there are instances where um, IRBs have been asked to review an old consent form and interpret it in the spirit that it was intended according to the standards of today. Okay. Um, but what I wanted to ask about was a little bit more about the issue of disclosing personal health information, which is essentially what you might be doing uh, through open data. Uh, I work partly for a lar very large data center in Ontario that shares large linked uh, data sets with hundreds of researchers, literally, each year. And the processes we go through to de-identify those data sets so that they can be shared, that comply with the requirements of the Privacy Commissioner, that the probability of re-identification of the individuals in that data set remains below a certain level, that the, the science that goes into de-identifying those data but allowing enough of the fields that the researchers require to remain populated by data is really quite complex science. It's not a small issue. Um, I, I, so I, I, I would say that this is an area that really does require a lot of attention uh, by the open uh, data movement, which I, I very, very strongly support. I had a couple of questions, but I really think they've been dealt with uh, already. Thank you. Any, any comments? Just a very brief one is that moves to open data as default increase the concerns about concert, uh, security. They don't decrease them for exactly the reasons you identify. Uh, Danny Goroff at Alfred P. Sloan Foundation has a lot of interesting work that he is doing with the different groups about mechanisms for anonymizing data uh, at a distance and in, in very interesting uh, new technologies to address those concerns. Yeah. 
And I think in making it um, usable for researchers is incredibly important. I don't know how many of you know that in HIPAA laws here in the US, you have to take out visit date. So you know when the person came back for a visit is, uh, how does it leave your data for your analysis? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Over here, please. Yes, uh, Marsha McNutt, Editor-in-Chief of Science. I wanted to comment on Stuart Buck's uh, Off With Their Heads uh, proposal. Uh, and just to mention that uh, journals actually have uh, such a, an option that they have actually used. And that is um, a specific case. If uh, authors submit a paper to one journal, and then while the paper is in uh, consideration at that one journal, if they submit it to another journal for consideration, that is considered verboten. And both journals will um, give those authors um, a prohibition from submitting to either of those journals for a period of time that's usually of the order of five years. And recently, we invoked that um, with uh, an author that submitted a paper to Cell. Um, Cell was taking too long. They submitted it to Science. Science found out it was under consideration for Cell. And both Cell and Science forbid that author for five years for submitting to either um, journal. So we could expand the conditions under which those um, uh, off with their head type um, uh, conditions um, lie. Of course, we're very concerned about due process to the authors, so we'd like the list to be very clear cut. But um, if the community really supports it, we're willing to, to do it. Thank you. Sir. Uh, uh, is this Kent, John Kent Johnson uh, from Sydney? Uh, in regards to reproducibility of RCT results, I have a uh, suggestion that I, th I would be interested in the panel's response to a, a suggestion to sort of jumpstart the process. And that is set up a, set up a, a, a real time uh, ongoing repository for clinical protocols, starting with the initial protocol, all subsequent amendments, and especially the statistical analysis plan, the detailed statistical analysis plan that remains confidential under some sort of lock key arrangement while the trial is ongoing. When it's submitted for publication, this material becomes available to the reviewers. And when it's published, it becomes available to anyone. And uh, as a point of disclosure, I was a previous FDA employee, and I saw a lot of the original protocols. And there are real issues with subsequent versions of the protocol, and especially with the details of the statistical analysis plan. So I'd be interested in the response of the panel for, for, for that suggestion. Uh, I totally agree, and that's what the Open Science Framework aims to do, uh, is support exactly that, not just for clinical trials, but for any kind of research. Uh, so it's a workflow project management tool for researchers as they go through their research process that they can use privately as long as they want. Uh, and then it has a mechanism for when they submit to a journal, they can create an anonymous link uh, that even de-identifies who the, owns the project. So it can go through blind review. Uh, and then a mechanism for registering uh, and making that available publicly and even embargoing parts of it for uh, multiple years. Uh, so really trying to support exactly the, the, the vision that you described. Um, another another thing I'll add too. I also think it's a, it's a great idea, and um, and all these steps that are being taken towards solving the problem. Um, uh, the idea that we could actually assert hypotheses that we're going to be testing in the data before we've started the analysis or before we've actually collected or gathered or actually analyzed the data, I think is a powerful one and could be incorporated into that framework too. And so um, it's not to say that um, a researcher is bound by their initial ideas when they start to do the study and, the, and, and they do the research and learn things and, and then things can change. But the idea that um, that uh, it would prevent things like sort of snooping in the data and sort of shaping your hypothesis to kind of match what's in the data, which of course undermines your statistical significance. So things like hypothesis pre-registration could actually start to step towards this um, resolving this reproducibility issue too through the mechanism you just described. 
I think it's going to take an initiative apart from, from perhaps an institution like this, because I don't think the journalists are going to take this on alone at this point in time. That's right. Over here. Hi, uh, I'm Lawrence Rajendran. I'm a professor of neuroscience at the University of Zurich, Switzerland, and I'm also the founder of Science Matters, the, uh, the journal that publishes single observations. I thought I would comment about, uh, also ask you a question about reproducibility and incentives. The Dr. Stodden, you showed this, uh, the Cell Reports preview of uh, the comment on the sorting of facts. I'm the kind yeah. of scientist who forgets to write that I stirred and stuff. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm as a, as a day, uh, in my day job, I'm a scientist and, and I do all these, um, you know, uh, these small uh, technical uh, performances that lead to experimental results. But to be honest, to, in today's world, if I have to publish to get incentives like, you know, tenure or promotion or, or, or grant, I had to publish in one of these journals. And I submitted a paper to science two and a half years ago. And we had three rounds of resubmission possibilities. And every time, there are at least three to six pages of reviews with all the, all the experiments that I have to do. I have to create a mouse because I, I said there is a SNP that, is, uh, that we identified. And if, I am, if I'm busy doing all these experiments and creating mouse, and even like trying to figure out things that uh, uh, you know, uh, absolutely impossible to do, it's, I'm not sure if it's my fault that I forget to write that I forgot to, you know, I stirred the beaker. And this storytelling business that has, that has uh, creeped into this, this system, uh, it really brings us, you know, enormous amount of fatigue in terms of writing 170 pages of, uh, of supplementary and, and information. It is just the way it is going. It's just impossible. And, and when I see a paper in Science or Nature, I just come back from a conf conference in Boston where there's a guy who says there is um, an exosome pancreatic marker with 100% specificity and s sensitivity. Believe me, when, I, when this paper was published in Nature two months ago, I, I was excited. It was great. Now we have a marker for pancreatic cancer. But there is also this apprehension. What if this paper is going to get retracted? Uh, in a couple of months down the lane because of your reproducibility issues and the incentives associated with the publishing so high. Okay, there's a lot in that comment. Anyone want to take a stab well, at I it? I could start with a bit of a stab, but there are many, uh, many questions embedded in there. I think something, so the, the first thing that I started to think about when you talked about all the steps and the complexity and being able to make that information available to the community is I started thinking about the framework of separating sort of empirical research, like you mentioned the article about the um, uh, stirring the beaker versus the centrifuge versus the computational um, steps, uh, things that took place on a computer. And even though the, the computational aspects are new, like decade or so, um, maybe 20 years, I think it's actually an easier problem than uh, tracking the, the sort of all the, all the steps in, that have been physically taken. And as that article highlighted, that it took two years to reconcile those physical processes happening in the two labs. So, um, but what we don't have um, in doing the computational um, uh, work is that same long history in the empirical side that has allowed things like um, strict standards around a lab notebook and what uh, what you track and record in, in an experiment. So we don't have that same notion. And I think uh, for doing the computational work, having that notion of a lab notebook where we really are keeping track of the, just, what did you do with outliers in your data set? How did you impute missing values? How did you make those decisions about the parameter settings for those algorithms? All of that could be recorded in a lab notebook. And that's the type of thing that would be standard in carrying out a bench experiment, for example, you record all of these things. So I think there's there's lessons to be learned and and from from both sides. And um, and one of the underlying notions that Michelle mentioned is this enormous complexity now in the um, experiments that we're carrying out makes this much more daunting. So the question is, what pieces do we need to to capture to make that narrative complete and make the um, results comprehensible? So I think we may have time for one more question from each side of the room, if we can keep it brief on, on both ends here. Thank you very much for your presentations this morning. You're all excellent presenters. My name is Lauren. I'm with Sense About Science. I'm the director for all trials here in the US. And one of our main missions is to kind of get the public involved and get this out so that we have uh, the support that we need to move forward. So here we are, and I think this was a really excellent comment last night at the Arnold Foundation dinner, playing inside baseball, where we're all here talking with each other and reinforcing 
all of our own notions about how science is portrayed, but really we need the public to be involved as well. So how do we, as a, a scientific community, involve the public, letting them know that this is an issue, yet not develop any kind of cynical public or mistrust between the scientific community and, uh, and our supporters? Uh, one, I, it's a great point, and I think the optimistic message to say in the context of a reproducibility crisis is that this is science about science, uh, and it's, it's embracing the key quality of science, which is self-correction. Uh, if people have hypothesized and all of John's overwhelming amount of data shows that there are issues in how it is uh, that the science is operating, then this, what scientists do instead of saying, no, we don't want to hear that, or no, that that's, can't be happening, is, oh, well, we should study that then. And then we should figure out how to fix it. Uh, that's, that's great. That is science doing its best. And it's happening. And it's happening. Yeah. So. Here we are. Thank you. Over here. OK, uh, let me tell you that lawyers can also be useful sometimes. They are not, they are not always roadblocks. Uh, we got access to unpublished study reports at the European Medicines Agency five years ago as the first in the world, but it took three years and a complaint to the European Ombudsman who sent some of his people. He has 70, 70, 70 lawyers employed. He sent some of his people to the EMAS headquarters in London, and they came back and said, there is absolutely nothing in clinical study reports or protocols that can be called commercially confident. So what I would like to see is create an Ombudsman here in the United States, please quickly as possible. And next, take the FDA down with good lawyers and by collaborating with Europe, I would be pleased to collaborate with some of you. I still have good contacts with the European Ombudsman to take the FDA down. It's a disgraceful institution. My, my other suggestion was, uh, we have employee of the month. Why not create villain of the month <laughs> and, and then make it public, Gilead and all the other companies, criminal companies. Let's do that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So are, are we out of time or do we have time for one more? One more. Yes. Thank you. Go, go, go right ahead. I think we have time for one more. Oh. All set? Okay. Well, please join me in thanking these panels for a terrific discussion.